This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. Like it's a very tough industry and it's very grueling. But if you keep that in mind and you keep like you remember that this is why you're doing it, because it's, you know, you love it and it's the outcome and the results, then I think it's really important. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The current staff shortages has its challenges, but it's highlighting many opportunities to look at a career in hospitality in a new light. Shifting vocations is fraught with challenges, but it could also have a life altering impact for the better. How does one make the shift and embrace a lifestyle where passion becomes part of their career? Caroline Helmy is the chef de cuisine of Sovereign at the Star Gold Coast. Caroline, how are you? I'm great, Hug. How are you? I'm good. You made the extraordinary leap from academia and um, a professional life um, into being a chef. What, what, what triggered that move? Yes, I did. Um, I've been now a chef, I think, just over 10 years. I realized the other day. I was like, time flies. <laughs> um, but I think it all started um, when I was very young because food in my family was a very big thing. And it's always been like a secret passion sort of. Um, and yeah, I just took the leap and said, might as well try it out. <laughs> Well, you're working in the corporate world at the time. Tell us about the role that you had and and how you made that switch. Yeah. So I was based in um, San Diego, California, and I was working uh, for a recruiting agency back then, um, doing all their training programs, setting up recruiting sessions. Um, And being in San Diego, it's a really big base because it's a connector in between LA and Mexico. And it's like there is a lot of traffic and a lot of people um, relocating and moving and it's also a military base so it was um, a lot of things happening and I was um, working with all sorts of companies um, produce companies um, truckers farmers like just everyone was looking for staff back then and then one of my clients was actually um, a produce company and he was looking for someone to join his team. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I really got along with him and we had a great rapport and it was something different. So I jumped on his marketing team. Um, I switched from recruiting to marketing, which was the same similar field to what I had studied at uni. And so it kind of makes sense. And then I was in there for a couple of years and then I was really having developing a great relationship with, with all the restaurants um, that were in LA and in San Diego. And that was kind of like, started working my mind of like, hey, this is, you know, such a great way of meeting people, connecting, and just, I love their story and everything that was behind. So that kind of maybe sparked the seed <laughs> to switch over. What was it like switching over and sort of starting a whole new career? Um, I think it was definitely challenging because it was, I was much older. I was probably like mid mid to late twenties. And, um, obviously when you're an apprentice, you're much younger and you're easy, easier to shape in your working techniques. But I would say when you're in your twenties, you kind of already sort of have your routine and the way of working. But, um, getting started in the kitchen, I really, I think the key thing for me was I worked with really passionate chefs. Um, so I really saw that as like something that was going to 
be a great advantage for me because they were taking the time to show me and, you know, go through the processes. And that was probably what kept me in the industry because I, if I was working with, I think, various chefs that weren't as passionate, I wouldn't have stayed in because it's definitely a challenging industry. Do you have any stories from those early years when you were getting started as a chef that sort of really ignited that passion for you? Um, I think just to see like see the end result of the customer and having them like when you're part of their celebration or you're creating like a cake for their celebration and then them taking the time to send you a note or write at the time, you know, cards and letters say, thank you so much for the cake. It was amazing. Like it really made the day. I think having that feeling of contributing to someone's special day was really like so rewarding in a way. And I think that's really something that I've kept along in my career of like, you're part of some, someone's special time and you're contributing. And so I think that was really a key factor. Cause I started off, um, um, working in pastry and doing all that side of, um, the kitchen. So that was really a cool way to start. You mentioned the seed was planted when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play in your family? Do you have any stories of feasts from that time? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my mom is um, Lebanese background, so obviously food in our household was always a major part. And um, I grew up in New Caledonia, so it's a French island, so French base as well as, you know, <laughs> I mean, everything revolves around food for the French, so... <laughs> Um, so my mom would always do like for her birthday, she would do like these lavish birthday cakes and <clears throat> she would really go above and beyond to create memories. And uh, like, I remember, you know, she was making bread on the kitchen floor and then we'd like us as kids, we'd walk through and then imprint and then we'd see it when she'd bake the bread. So I think it was really like her putting in all the time and explaining all the recipes and all that was always like she was always trying to involve us and um, it was, I think, just a childhood memory that is so precious. Tell us a bit about New Caledonia and the food from there. Yep. So New Caledonia is a tiny island um, just off of Brisbane, actually, probably like two and a half hours away. Um, it's not far from Fiji and New Zealand, but most people haven't really heard of it, unfortunately. So I'm trying to spread the word as much as we can. <laughs> um, but yes, it's a French island and the food culture there is really like, we're quite fortunate because there's a lot of seafood at our axis and um, like I remember a lot of mud crabs and a lot of crayfish and a lot of octopus. We would go fishing when we were kids. So seafood is one of the main resources. And then uh, prawns is also one of the highly recognized. Um, it's actually here, it's called paradise prawns. And when it's raw, it's a blue prawn. And it's really used a lot in sashimi restaurants um, across the world because it has such a sweet taste when it's raw and people use it as a delicacy. So um, the food scene in New Caledonia is highly focused on seafood and of course it has um the breads the cheeses all of um, that aspect of the french culture as well as the local um local items like venison venison is a really big thing it's like a staple it's you find it in supermarket and it's a staple in everyone's household really um so it's really about utilizing different items that are available for us which is quite amazing you made the uh, jump over to uh, the Gold Coast. What, what was it like immersing yourself in that sort of food scene? Um, it was interesting because obviously my background was like food was a big thing. I think you showed your love in the food you would present and how you would serve um, someone. And then coming to an Australian culture where food is important, but I think it has a different role. <laughs> um, and... It was, yeah. I mean, I've tried so many things when I first came here, like pies and all, you know, um, pup food, which wasn't really a thing back home. So I was always the one that was like, I've never tried this. What is this? <laughs> so my friends really enjoyed um, immersing me into that. <laughs> 
tell us about that experience. Were there, were there some things that you tried for the first time that you really loved? Um, that I really loved. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess. Um, let me see. Yeah, probably a fish and chip combo. I'm not sure if it really classifies as Australian, probably more New Zealand. But I feel like um, that whole fish and chip culture, which I've never tried before. And I was like, okay, and this is interesting. And then how you would go to just a local, um, the local shop and they would do it right there. So that was really um, always super nice. Um, and then the pies was quite a new concept for me. I've never tried the pies and then all the sauces that go with it. Um, so that was interesting. <laughs> Take us into the kitchen. You've spent a, uh, a lot of your career in, on the Gold Coast. What were the really important um, kitchens that you worked in in the early days? Um, I think at the very start when I was in Videri, I worked with some very passionate chefs and very um, talented and um, they just had so much experience. They've come from the biggest kitchens in London and overseas. And I got a chance to work with them and having their skill and their precision and just their palette of them, the combinations they would come up with was really an eye opener for me because it kind of had the turn factor of like the way you can use ingredients and it doesn't always have to be savory or sweet. And it's just playing with the ingredient to its best of its ability and then just kind of testing the boundaries. Um, you know, like back then doing caramels with fat was, wasn't really a thing or having fruits in a savory dish wasn't really something that I had been exposed to. So I think having the ability to work with these chefs and trying all these different flavors was really amazing and what shaped me to become the chef I am today. You've worked in a couple of different uh, restaurants there, but Kiyomi is one of them. What was it like delving into the world of Japanese cuisine? Um, yeah, I did um, some time in Kiyomi as their sous chef, and that was amazing. Um, it was really a great experience, and it was my first role um, that I joined the Star Entertainment Group with. Um and I hadn't worked in a Japanese kitchen before, so it was um, definitely interesting. There was definitely um, being in a kitchen where the culture was a really important factor and having to manage and coordinate like the Japanese um, chef was something new to me. And it was <laughs> definitely a learning experience. <laughs> um so that was quite interesting. And, you know, having chefs that were English is in their first language. And so managing all of that aspect was also um, an excellent learning curve. And it was quite interesting. And also working with, you know, all these Japanese ingredients, which I have never been exposed to. Um, so that was always um, great to test and trial and do a lot of experimenting and just seeing the response from the customer was great. Did that access to those unique ingredients, did that affect the way that you um, cook uh, now? Yeah, definitely. Um, because I think a few years ago, like the Japanese French, um, like there was quite a boom of the fusion food, I guess, or the combination of them too, because they have very similar um, techniques and way of working where, um, they're very structured and very methodical. So I think that combination of the Japanese and the French work really well together. And so that was my background of like, you know, the really classical French training and then using the Japanese ingredients to kind of lighten it, bring it to life and make it a little bit more modern. Um, so I think one of my favorite ingredients that I worked with was um, like yuzu and pickled plums. Like that was really something that even today I still go back to and use in all sorts of way. Um, so that was really amazing. These days you're uh, the chef de cuisine of a fascinating but yet kind of secretive restaurant. Can you tell us about it? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, I'm currently running um, the restaurant at the Darling Hotel, part of the Star, and it's called Sovereign. And it's really a space that's catering to um, the gaming world and the gaming customer. 
So it's, I've been in that role, I think about three years now since they opened up actually. And it's a really different customer. It's probably like one of my old chefs would say, it's the hardest four top you're ever going to do because um, having a gamer as a, as a customer, like he's very, you know, emotional, but he's also very routine based and, his whole experience is going to depend on how he went on the gaming floor. So <laughs> either he comes to the restaurant to like change his mind and, you know, turn his luck around or he comes because he's had a terrible time on the gaming floor and he just wants to forget. <laughs> so <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's quite interesting, but it's also like an amazing venue because it's not open to the public. So the, customer that I have, it's, he's a regular, he'll come like five nights a week, um, religiously and he'll order the same thing day in and day out. And he, sometimes he doesn't like change. He doesn't like to experiment. This is what he wants. And then you kind of, you know, that's it. You just have to deal with it. But also, um, there are some non-traditional, um, customers will, they'll come and they'll, you know, really want to try something different and, they'll be open and, and adventurous and it'll be quite amazing. So, but they also give you feedback instantly because <laughs> um, depending on, you know, their mood and their persona on the time, they'll be yeah, quite vocal on <laughs> their experience. Well, what's this, what's it like for you as a chef to experience this role in, in with this sort of restaurant? Um, I think it's, been an amazing learning curve. Um, I think as a chef and a manager, I've grown a whole lot in this space. Um, and I see that at the very start, yes, the customer is difficult and he's very demanding and he only wants these things. But then once you build a rapport with them and you have that open communication and you tell them a little bit more about yourself and your background and what you like to do, then they're open to building that relationship and understanding and trusting you and letting you take them on to this journey that um, I do day in and day out. So I think it's been a great stepping stone and being part of um, the star group. I mean, there's a lot happening in that space. So <laughs> it's definitely um, a good platform to grow into. Tell us a bit about the offering. What's the, what is the scale of it? And what sort of food are you uh, cooking at the moment? Um, so my kitchen is split up in two lines, sort of. So one um, will have like, I guess it would be like a modern Australian with my French, French influences. And then the other side is we'd have two walks, steamer baskets, um, and the whole section where it's um, an Asian menu offering. And we could have, um, currently I have chefs that, you know, are from China, some uh, from Thailand, um, some Korean, some Japanese, like I have a very diverse um, team. And so our menu is sort of like walk line and then the grill side. So it's about working together, of course, and presenting a product that makes sense and Sometimes, you know, we also have live tanks and um, we have a lot of live seafoods for there as part of our offering. And yeah, so we have a lot of, <laughs> our menu is quite extensive because <laughs> of the customer that we're catering to. Because we also do out of that space, um, the in-room dining piece and then um, any private uh, rooms or penthouses that would want catering comes out of my kitchen. So, but I think my menu is more, um, it's really focused on the ingredients and it's not, it's not overcomplicating. It's just letting the ingredient shine and really working in season and what's on the market and having a relationship with the producers and the growers to see what they have in store and what I can showcase and bring to the table and highlight for my guest. That French Australian offering that you have as part of what you do. Do you have any dishes that you can tell us about that sort of exemplify the offering? Um, good question. I have like, I change my menu quite often because I think I feel I have like, um, 
a weekly offering, which is part in addition to my menu. So I think, um, let's see, I love like a good um, kingfish and then I'll do it with like this foie gras sauce. And it's really the contrast of like the fat of the foie gras and then the kingfish, which is really clean and crisp. So I find that it goes really well together. Um, and using obviously a lot of butter is <laughs> a forefront in a lot of my dishes, whether it's like prawns or um, really high Wagyu marbling steak that we work with stockyard. So there is a whole bunch um, of amazing dishes that we have. There's an incredible staff shortage and skills shortage at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. What sort of opportunities are you seeing unfold though in the industry for those looking to get into it? Um, yes, definitely recruiting is quite challenging. And I think for everyone, whether you're, you know, the small restaurant or on the bigger scale. But I think um, through this last two years of obviously the hard times that COVID brought on everyone, it's maybe made everyone reevaluate like maybe their work pace and what they actually, what's their happy place and where they want to go. So I think it's been a great opportunity for everyone to kind of reassess and then when now the industry is re-kicking and it's ready to go full force again maybe you know take the time take more time into training the juniors and spending really that time with the apprentices because at the end of the day they're the next generation of chefs out there so um i think training them and taking the time and really explaining the process to them is a key factor and I love to work with apprentices and I feel that everybody should take more time into that because they're so you know young and really shapeable and I mean I remember when I was an apprentice like that's kind of what shaped me so I feel that I can give back to the industry and do the same thing then I'm doing my part. The industry is traditionally male dominated, but we've seen a, the shift in paradigm there. Is that something that you're you're seeing? And um, do you think there's as a role from a leader like you in in mentoring and encouraging women to get into the industry? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a very male dominated, and I think even to this day, it, there has been a change. But I think there's still a lot of a way to go um, for female leaders. Um, I think in our, in my space, we probably are like three, four, um, female leaders. So compared to male, which is obviously <laughs> much more. So I think it's great that there's a change and it's great that it's being highlighted, but I feel there's still a little bit way to go. And I'm glad that, you know, one step at a time, everybody can contribute and be part of that change. How do you get the best out of your team? Um, I think for me, it's really about taking the time to explain the end result or where you want to go and taking them on a journey with you because I feel like the really firm, you know, traditional French way of like, hey, th this is what I want and you're I'm not going to explain the process or the why. I feel like that doesn't work in today's world because people are more, you know, aware and they're more curious and they don't follow that hierarchy that was set up in the French, traditional French kitchen. <clears throat> so I think for me, it's really important to value my team's opinion and kind of, because I work in a very diverse, multi multiculturally diverse kitchen, take on their experiences and their input, even if it, <clears throat> even if at the end, like it's not going to make the cut, but at least I'll think about it and have it for my next dish or I'll have them presented in a way that could work. Um, but I think that how to get the best result out of someone is really taking them on the journey with you and being patient. And sometimes it's, you know, going to be a good end result. And sometimes it's probably not, but it's all about the experience and, and trying and doing all that fun stuff. 
you mentioned you love working with apprentices and the opportunities to help shape their careers at that early stage. Do you do you remember your first days as an apprentice and how you felt stepping into the kitchen then? Um, yeah, definitely. I think I felt um, as most people probably do, I think overwhelmed and really uncertain and you don't know what to expect and you don't know the expectations and, and there's, you know, maybe people don't value apprentices as a key role in the kitchen, but they're actually (laughs) the core of the kitchen and they do, you know, all the grunt work and all the prep work that's um, vital to the operation. But I think when I first started, the first few weeks I was like, Oh my God, what am I doing? Like (laughs) first I was like, I'm crazy for doing this now. And then I was like, well, let me just try. I had kind of dedicated that, Hey, I'm going to try it out. If it doesn't work, then at least, you know, I always have a backup plan. So (laughs) the the last sort of year and a half, two years have been pretty challenging with all sorts of lockdowns and changes. What sort of impact did it have on what you do? Um, yeah, it's definitely been challenging and I think everyone, but I feel like on the Gold Coast, we've been lucky, luckily compared to some of the other states in Australia. Um, but I think it's just, it was a very difficult time, obviously, you know, having such a big team, um, and being part of an organization that has thousands of chefs where you have to have that conversation and, you know, very difficult time for everyone and I think it affected um, everyone on an intense level but um, I think the how it was maybe you know there was always like a light at the tunnel of like hey you know this is the worst but it can only get better right like we're at the bottom all these lockdowns every two seconds like the uncertainty of like hey are we can open this weekend not open it was always like it's out of our hands we can only do so much you know we'll wait for the direction of the government or the state and then just kind of control the controllables. Like it's not, you, yeah, it was just out of our hands. So I think reassuring my team and all the industry and all the colleagues that I had that at the end of the day, like we can only put our best foot forward and ride the wave of this crazy COVID. And hopefully now we're on the very end bit. (laughs) (laughs) Has this period of time changed the way you approach your job and and communicate with your staff? Um, Yeah, definitely. Because I think I'm more aware on maybe, you know, their personal circumstances. And I think the fact that um, nobody was able to see their family. I mean, for me, all my family is overseas. So it's Mm -hmm. like impacted me uh, right on. Like, I think not being able to have your family or seeing that, home that you feel like, you know, gives you energy on another level. I think it's really affected how people communicate and how they receive messages where they're probably a little bit more sensitive or they'll react a little bit more to something that is pretty straightforward, but maybe because they have so many things on the personal level going on that um, is weighing in on their mind. And so I think I'm really aware on the message that I'm delivering and how I'm delivering the message because for me, it's probably like, hey, I just, you know, this is what we need to achieve today. But maybe they've had, you know, a terrible week or they've had their circumstance or something's happened and they weren't mm-hmm. able to attend or, I mean, there's all sorts of factors. So I think being more self-aware and being open to, you know, maybe some tougher conversations that you wouldn't have with team members and your colleagues these days um, is part of the new normal, I think. You've had the most incredible career shift. What is it that you love about what you do? Um, I think I love being part of the experiences because for me, food, like I've been lucky enough to travel around the world and dine at these amazing um, restaurants. And I think it's really about the memory you create and how that stays with you for the rest of your life. Like I still remember when I was, you know, in the South of France uh, visiting my mom and we'd walk down the street in winter and it was freezing. And then we'd see these um, chestnut stalls and you, they just roast them there and then they'd give you and you eat them on the street. Like those memories, it's just something that stays with you. So 
I think it's really important when I'm working that I think of the people enjoying the food and the memories that they're creating and the celebrations that they're going through. So I think if you work, like it's a very tough industry and it's very grueling, but if you keep that in mind and you keep like, you remember that this is why you're doing it because it's, you know, you love it and it's the outcome and the results, then I think it's really important. That's amazing advice. And we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just a bit of your story. Caroline, please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Yes, that was amazing. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm glad I could share a little bit of my story. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.